Yo, what's up everybody? My name is Crouchy Tuna. Today we're going to be looking at the Lightning Arrow Deadeye. Lightning Arrow Deadeye is what I consider to be one of the best league starters for the 322 expansion. It is a tri elemental stacking uh, build. Well, that means that we're going to be taking all fire, lightning, and cold damage on our bow and equipment. We're going to be gaining additional benefits because of the Trinity Gem, which allows us to. Um, you know, amplify those damage types as well as penetrate those elements. In addition, there is a new mastery, which 25% of the time allows us to treat monster resistances as inverted. And basically what that means is that if there's a monster with 70 resistance, what it's going to do is one in every four shots, that resistance is going to be treated as negative 70 resistance. Because of that, we're getting about 25% more damage from that mastery. And in turn, it's all the penetration that we need for in-game bosses and um, to be killing our, you know, our watch some bosses and that sort of stuff. And that is also why it is, you know, very advantageous to go for three elements rather than stacking one these days. In addition, in early game, the build has actually received substantial buffs because of the addition of arrows on the passive skill tree so you're able to gain two additional arrows on the passive skill tree and then two additional arrows on your ascendancy meaning that you're shooting five arrows without the need of using uh, lesser multiple projectiles or greater multiple projectiles which are less multipliers and those less multipliers would negatively affect your dps when entering maps and we can also change that gem out for something like a more multiplier or for example like a projectile return gem that is coming in the 322 expansion so essentially that allows us to get a ton more damage in early game and with precise technique which is a keystone that makes you deal 40 percent more attack damage however you cannot do critical strike because of that we're able to get a ton of damage early on where earlier it would sort of be more difficult to get that damage because you would have to actually get critical strike on your bow to deal additional damage basically what happened to the build is it gained a lot of early help and has now actually become one of the best league starters um, in the game in my opinion but the difficulty of this build to start off is very low. You're actually going into maps with pretty much little to no gear whatsoever. There's many very cheap uniques and accessible uniques that you can purchase early on to accelerate your progress as well. Because the build is very generic. However, I have done many runs all the way to Eater Exarch. I have done an Eater Exarch run in nine hours total. That was basically on a four link all the way up until the boss itself, where I actually managed to get a lucky five link. So the budget of it is, uh, I would say, more on the low end for early game. However, it can become very expensive later on when you are trying to min max it. It is also a popular build, right? So there's going to be a high percentage of softcore players playing this build, meaning demand for items and good items for it are, is going to be quite high. But that in turn also means that a lot of people are going to be crafting for the build. So what happens, there's going to be very expensive items on the high end, but the mid and low range items for this build are going to be very cheap because of crafters crafting in bulk and having excess of sort of mid tier gear that they're going to be selling on to players. The very high end gear is going to be very in demand and expensive. But the mid and low end gear is sort of going to be very accessible to people. It is why also I think is a good league starter because it's essentially if you are playing the meta, it's going to be overall easier for you to obtain the gear that you need to succeed. And it's going to be accessible to you earlier. There's a caveat to that, which is some of the uniques that you would like to use for the, uh, for the build. For example, Hyrie's Ire which is the best in slot chest for the mid-range build. Essentially, a high resire is going to be costing quite a bit, especially a six nick early on. But of course, there are alternatives, right? The chest doesn't mean, you know, doesn't make or break the build per se. However, it is a very good chest for endgame and something that we do want to use. This is not a bossing build. I want to put that out straight away. This build uh, is actually pretty good at tackling the watch zone bosses early on. And you can boss on the build if you like. However, we are not the tankiest build. We are actually building our defenses mostly to survive in most scenarios in maps, right? We're building our defenses around evasion and suppression and getting as much of those as possible. You know, suppression is going to be capped out and evasion is going to be as close to 95% as possible so that we can actually evade the incoming attacks. However, we do not have great means of reducing the damage we take. So it is going to be a build that we're going to try to avoid taking damage with. And when we do take damage, we will find ourselves under a little bit of danger. Because of that, though, we are going for a lot of recovery with it. So we will be stacking Leech and Life Gain on hit, so that when you do get hit in the event that you are taking damage, as long as you are shooting something, you're going to be able to recover your health. And honestly, that is not a mechanic that should be like taken lightly. It's really like Leech is insane in this game. It's what is going to help us sort of sustain through maps, you know, stay alive, essentially. So... 
the bossing is not great and the defenses are relatively low, but you are um, set up to succeed in mapping content, which is where it exceeds, and the build is phenomenal at it. And that being mentioned, the lead mechanics that it does excel at are map mechanics such as legions, you can do blights, you can do expeditions as well on top of that, especially with a mastery that allows you to circumvent block and things like that. So there's an attack mastery that makes it so monsters cannot block your attacks, which is really nice since a lot of those monsters do block. Your build is built for mapping and that is its primary focus. So let's talk about the Ascendancy Breakdown. The first one we want to get is Gathering Winds. Gathering Winds will give us Gale Force, and Gale Force will increase our action speed up to a maximum of 20%. This is going to give us a massive multiplier to our movement speed and attack speed. Because of that, we'll be able to move through the campaign much quicker and through maps later on in endgame. The second Ascendancy we want to take is Farshot. Farshot will give us additional damage when we are further away from targets. When you want to deal maximum output of damage, make sure that you're positioning yourself as far as possible from the target, and also position your ballistas that way too. This can lead up to 60% more damage. Third essence that we'll go for at the Merciless Labyrinth is Endless Munition. Endless Munition allows us to fire two additional projectiles, which is going to give us additional projectiles on both our Lightning Arrow and Artillery Ballista. What that means is more single target damage and more clear. Lastly, at Uber Labyrinth, we want to get Focal Point. Focal Point is going to give us 75% increased effect of our Sniper's Mark, as well as 25% less damage taken from enemies near your marked targets. So essentially, what that means is that you're going to be taking less damage while mapping, and you're going to be dealing a ton more damage. Additionally, the 75% increased effect is going to give you additional splits because of your Sniper's Mark, meaning your clear is also going to be boosted because of this. Next, let's talk about the Offensive and Defensive Scalers. So since we are elemental attack gems and we're using both lightning arrow and artillery barista, you want to get as much flat elemental damage as possible. We want to stack attack speed, projectile damage, attack damage, and we also always want to make sure that our accuracy rating is capped. Accuracy rating is a percent of um, attack chance. So basically you're going to be getting a chance to hit enemies at a percent and make sure that you want to be checking this as much as possible so that you always remain capped. That is, that is very, very important. For our defenses, we're going to be getting a ton of evasion from our gear, our flasks, the skill tree, and grace. We want to be taking some physical damage taken as on our helmet, wherever possible, and on top of that, maybe on our lethal pride as well later on. Of course, your elemental resistances must always be capped, and we want to get 100% ailment avoidance as soon as possible, as well as 100% spell suppression. Leech and life gain on hit will be our main recovery option, and that is the way that we mitigate small hits. On top of the fact that we won't be getting hit by many of them, since we have a lot of evasion, this is going to give us time to recover in between packs and in between damage that we take. So as previously mentioned, it is extremely important to make sure that you're always capped on accuracy. So you have 100% of your attacks uh, hitting targets. Sources of accuracy will include the passive skill tree and precision. Make sure that you're always checking your character sheet to ensure that you're always capped on this. Next, I want to talk about an early scaler, the Precise Technique Keystone. So we mentioned this earlier, but the Precise Technique Keystone allows us to deal more attack damage if your accuracy rating is higher than your maximum life. However, the downside of this is that you never deal critical strikes. So in early game where we are not actually able to focus on capping our critical strike chance or getting as close to as possible to 100 or investing into critical strike multiplier, this is actually a way for us to access a lot more damage and gain a huge spike for our early progression in the game. However, you need to make sure that you're always keeping your accuracy rating higher than your life. So make sure that you're actually checking that. If it is not higher, then obviously you want to be leveling your precision a little bit higher, or you want to be getting, of course, masteries and things like that, or additional passives on the tree to ensure that it is, because 40% more damage is very, very important. Later on, however, once we do swap the critical strikes, we will be using bases such as the Spine Bow. The Spine Bow is a base that has a high base critical strike chance and very high attack speed on top of that. Additionally, you increase your critical strike chance with the passive tree and flasks, as well as power charges, thanks to the Mana Forge Zero setup. Another scaler we use is the Trinity Support Gem. Now, this might seem a little bit tricky, but it's very simple. Essentially, what you want to do with the Trinity Support Gem is you want to be alternating what damage type you're hitting the monster with within a time frame of uh, tw two seconds. Essentially, what happens is that every time you hit an enemy, you hit with a, a damage type, and that damage type is going to roll. And that roll is dependent on how much damage you have of that element. Luckily, lightning damage has a very high variance. So between low and high, it's going to be rolling within that. So as long as you have a high variance of lightning damage and you have a lot of lightning damage, as well as the secondary elements such as cold or fire damage, it's going to flip-flop between those two meaning that you're going to be hitting with one of those at a higher value than the other, like alternating between attacks. So that's going to give you the resonance. 
And what this gem allows you to do essentially is to get a ton more damage and a ton of elemental penetration. So in the late game variant of the build, we're going to be using Comb Spirit and Berserk. Comb Spirit are gloves that convert your life regeneration into rage. Rage regeneration takes place of this and it's going to be enabling the Berserk mechanic. Berserk is a very, very powerful gem because it is going to give us more attack speed and more movement speed as well as less damage taken. Thanks to the Comb Spirit gloves, we'll be able to get pretty decent uptime, meaning you'll be having this bonus for about 70% of the time while mapping. The only time it's going to be down, of course, it's going to be during the cooldown of the gem, which is five seconds. To amplify that, we'll be using the cheap, early, unique, the Vol's Vision. So this is going to be sort of cheaper as the time goes on. Early on, it's going to be a little bit more expensive. However, as the league progresses and the market gets flooded with these items, it's going to, of course, be cheaper. And that is why we actually want to be buying this in the later stages of progression. But what this helmet does is it's going to give us 400% life regeneration per second if no equipped items are corrupted, as well as 12% increased maximum life if no equipped items are corrupted. So make sure that no items you have are corrupted. Of course, jewels and things like that can be corrupted, but items that you have on your character mustn't be corrupted for this to take place. So make sure you double, triple check that. As previously mentioned, we will be taking 100% ailment avoidance for our defensives, and that is going to be achieved through the Ancestral Vision Jewel. The Ancestral Vision Jewel gives us 50% ailment avoidance because we're going to be capped from spell suppression. So once we have 100% spell suppression, 50% of that is going to be converted to ailment avoidance. Essentially, it's going to allow us to get full ailment avoidance cap very easily. Spell suppression is going to drastically reduce the damage we take from spells by up to 53%. It is a very, very extremely valuable uh, defensive layer as it's basically prevent us from taking big hits from monsters that are dealing spell damage. Additionally, Berserk is going to give us uh, damage reduction while it's active and the evasion is going to circumvent us from being hit multiple times in a row. And on top of that, the recovery is going to be making sure that we do when we do get hit, we are recovering all of the life back. For the playstyle of this build, the build is very straightforward and very easy. All you have to do is basically just right click and all of the monsters die. However, when you do encounter a tankier monster, you do want to put down your artillery ballistas. This is up to four ballistas. And yeah, you're just going to be shooting your main target with lining arrow and your ballistas are going to be following up on those shots and also, um, you know, targeting the monster that you are targeting. When you are bossing, however, and you want to take on much more difficult targets, you actually want to be replacing your chain support for barrage support. And what this is going to do is it's going to basically like focus all of your arrows into one ray and give you additional damage with both your what was your clear ability. It's going to turn that into a single target ability. Make sure you're putting down your artillery ballistas before you're shooting your target. Place yourself far away from that target. Gain benefit of far shot. Try to avoid all of his attacks because a lot of the boss attacks in this game are very deadly to this build. The farming strategies that this build excels at are mostly mapping focused. So you're going to be looking to farm influenced altars, delirium, breach, blight, legions, harvest. You can also do heist, expedition and bestiary. However, you're not really going to be taking on bosses with this build. So keep that in mind. For leveling, make sure that you refer to Tai Tai's handly tips and the guide that is linked in the description below. What you want to keep in mind is that you're going to be killing all bandits so that you get use of the two skill point passives. And for the Pantheons, you really want to early on use the Rislata Pantheon so that you can gain flash charges so you can essentially have good flash sustain when you go into labs and things like that. And as previously mentioned, the order for laboratories are first gathering winds, second far shot, third endless munitions. I don't want to go into too much detail about the gems that you use while leveling, but I do want to speak a little bit about the reason as to why we want to use these. Early on, we want to use Caustic Arrow for Act 1, and that is for clear only. Then we will use Burning Arrow for Brutus. Sniper Mark should be used on rare or boss enemies you come across. It's going to give you a massive DPS boost. Later on, at level 12, we will be taking Lining Arrow for the clear. For your single target, you want to be using your Lining Arrow with your Ballista support. At level 28, you'll be swapping that Ballista support to Artillery Ballista. Artillery Ballista is going to give us so much more damage for single target, and it's basically going to allow you to zoom all the way through the campaign. If you can actually obtain one, a Val Lining Arrow is an incredible boost uh, to our single target. So whenever you get a Val Orb, do put that onto a Lining Arrow gem in hopes of getting a Val Lining Arrow, because it's going to basically annihilate any rare enemy or boss you come across. If you do wish to do Val side areas to heighten the chances of you actually dropping a Val Lining Arrow, that is absolutely up to you, but it is something that you should be looking out for. These are all the skill gems that you will acquire in the campaign in this order, and I will basically just show them on screen real quick.
As previously mentioned, we want to kill all bandits. And for our pantheons, we want to take the Brian King, because this essentially is going to be giving us stun avoidance once we've been hit by a stunning hit in the past two seconds. And later on, we want to upgrade that for freeze immunity. And that is going to be very important until we get our ailment avoidance in endgame. For our minor pantheon, you can choose between any that you like. Tukohama is really nice because it gives you additional physical damage reduction and some life regeneration. Alternatively, if you do not have corrupted blood immunity or a flask yet, you can go for upgraded Ralakesh. Or you could take Abrath so that you're not dying from burning ground from Searing Exarch Alters. The most important moments are going to be going from your leveling build onto your early endgame build. And that is because we will go from non-crit with precise technique to critical strike as soon as we get a bow that has critical strike chance on a good base. So make sure to check out the leveling trees right here on the max roll and swap between leveling early and mid and late. And this is going to sort of be tied to the progression that you find yourself in. And the milestones in the guide are going to be matching the tree that you want to be using. So make sure that you're keeping in mind that when you're playing uh, in the early game and don't have critical strike chance, you'll have the spec. But when you move to critical strike chance around the mid game, you want to unspec this and ensure that you have a bow with critical strike chance that way. If you want to see the progression of the tree, you can use the arrows above here, and that's going to be showing you the order in which you want to take the passives. That is a very handy way for you to know exactly uh, what skills you want to take and when, and when you want to respec on top of that. So for gear progression in the written guide, we will go over every single item that you want to buy and at what point you want to buy it as well. So we go through the order of every single item and the progression that you want to take in early, mid, and end game. The most important things to care about early on, of course, are your weapon and decent rare gear. So essentially, you want to be getting a 400 plus elemental DPS bow with high attack speed, and you want to potentially have an open slot for a craft. What you will prioritize crafting on your bow will always be flat damage if you have an open prefix, or attack speed if you have an open suffix. And if you have both of those things already, then you want to craft double damage, which is an unveil. The essences you want to craft your bow with, if you do actually want to craft a bow, are going to be Essence of Anger, Essence of Wrath, or Essence of Hatred, as they will guarantee a flat elemental damage roll. For your air gear, you will always prioritize evasion bases. So for body armor, you want to be using an Assassin's Garb. For helmet, you want the Lion Pelts. Boots are Slink Boots. Gloves are Slink Gloves. These are because these bases will actually give you the most amount of flat evasion and that evasion is going to be converted to chance to evade attacks. Additionally, evasion gear is the only base type that can roll spell suppression. And as we previously mentioned, spell suppression is one of our key defenses in this build. It's going to allow you to mitigate spell damage you take and keep you alive. In Path of Exile, flasks are very, very important. They're going to be a huge boost both your offenses and defenses. In the early game, we will use a Divine Life Flask and you want to have instant recovery on this if possible with protection from bleeds crafted. And you can actually craft this in the bestiary. Make sure to check out your menagerie when you finish the campaign and craft that on as soon as possible. We will use a Silver Flask for better uptime of Onslaught on single target. A Quicksilver Flask so we can move more swiftly. A Granite Flask, this is going to be mostly useful in the early game because it's going to allow you to mitigate some of that physical damage that you take. However, since we are not stacking a lot of armor, it is going to be only effective against very small hits. And finally, the Jade Flask, which is going to be massive and it's going to boost our evasion rating. And you also, of course, want to craft these following suffixes. Increased evasion rating during effect, movement speed during effect, and also reduced effect of shock during effect. And that is going to be something we want to have until you are fully ailment immune. Early on, having a 5 or a 6 link is going to give you a massive boost in damage. So whenever possible, if you have some currency spare, look for one of those. Early on, the Tabula Rasa is a staple item that you can look for that is going to give you 6 links. However, the chest does not have any stats on it. Recently, however, we did get a mastery that gives you 15% increased maximum life if there are no life modifiers on equipped body armor. So we are are actually getting a little bit of stats by using this at the expense of one passive skill point. The Karui Ward is a really nice early game amulet that we want to use for this build. That is because we will be using a mastery that gives us damage when we have projectile speed. So essentially what it's going to do is it's going to give us 30% increased damage from the projectile speed, 30% increased projectile damage, a bit of accuracy, some movement speed, some strength, as well as some dexterity. We do want to anoint additional projectile damage and projectile speed on this. We want to use two verdant oils and one teal oil. And the choice of this anoint is because it's very cheap and accessible early on. If you do want to use any of the following uniques, you can. They are very strong. We can actually use many uniques for this build. However, keep in mind, the uniques have downsides and the downsides for them are that there usually is no life or resistance on them depending on what slot you're looking at. The following are the uniques that you want to look for. 
The Prism Weave is going to give us a ton of flat damage, as well as elemental resistance and elemental damage with attack skills. The Yoke of Suffering is a great amulet because it's going to give us up to 15% increased damage taken by enemies. That is because we have 5% increased damage taken for each uh, ailment that we inflict on them. And we do inflict all shock, chills, and ignites. Additionally, it's going to make all of our elemental damage shock, which is going to increase the shock value of our skill. Three-step assault are very good early game boots. These are going to give us 100% increased evasion rating while you have onslaught, which is all the time while we're mapping, as well as some movement speed and chance to avoid ailments. However, this is going to be conditional, but we will be phasing for the most part while mapping as we get phasing on kill on the passive skill tree. The Bisco's Leash is going to give you Rampage, at the expense of the item having no stats aside for that and some cold resistance. Rampage, however, is extremely valuable for a mapping character because it's going to give you a ramping damage and speed increase as you're killing monsters. This is one of my favorite belts to have in the early game for sure. The Poise Prism is a quiver that was introduced recently that is going to give you a ton of damage early on. However, it is outscaled by other quivers very quickly. If you do buy one of these, make sure that you're actually looking out for a rare quiver as soon as possible, as they generally are very easy to come by and very easy to craft on top of them. Some rings you can look out for as well. Salio's Sign, which is going to give you a ton of damage, some evasion rating, and the Oop of All, going to give you some increased damage, attributes, and elemental resistance. However, the variance on these rolls is huge, so make sure that you are buying one with decent rolls. So that about sums up the early game progression. Now let's talk a little bit about mid game and mid game is going to be where we are actually doing the swap to our critical strike chance. So when looking out for a bow, we want to look for the following bases. We want the bone bow, the ivory bow or the spine bow. Which one of these you choose, it doesn't really matter as we are not really interested in the flat physical damage of the bow. Rather, we just want to get a bow base with the highest critical strike chance and attack speed. We are looking for the following stats. Adds number to number cold fire lining damage on the uh, on local damage bow. So essentially what you're going to be looking for is high elemental damage bow with attack speed and critical strike chance. The easiest way to craft these is to look for a bow with a fractured flat elemental damage roll and then proceed to using deafening essence of hatred, anger or wrath. An example of a good bow to use for the swap is this one here. It's going to be around 700 elemental damage with critical strike chance and crafted attack speed. At this point, you want to be using a six link for your main clear ability. And if you can, five link this bow and put your artillery ballista in it for a substantial DPS boost for single target. Once we do make our bow swap to critical strike chance, we want to use the Irish Truth. Irish Truth is going to grant us level 30 precision. This means that we can drop most of the accuracy skill nodes on the passive skill tree. And on top of that, it's going to make that precision have a lot less reservation. In addition, this amulet will give us a ton of critical strike multiplier, which bow builds are actually very lacking. And Calling Strike. Calling Strike essentially is going to eliminate targets that are below 10% HP on hit. So essentially what that translates to is 10% more damage. You want to look for the following annoyance. Assassination is the most expensive one of the lot, but the best one. Assassination is going to give us 25% critical strike multiplier, as well as 25% increased critical strike chance. Throat Seeker will give us 30% critical strike multiplier. True Strikes will give us 15% multiplier and 45% increased critical strike chance. Pigeon Vices are very, very strong uh, options for our belt slot because they will give us access to Abyssal Sockets. And Abyssal Sockets have very good stats for elemental attack builds. So what you want to do is you want to purchase a Stygian Vice of item level 82 plus, and you want to use either Harvest Reforges or Essences to guarantee resistances or attributes on them. If you're looking for anything with sort of life resistance, as well as an open prefix to craft increased elemental damage with attack skills. However, you can always settle for something less or more, depending on your budget. For your Abyss Jewel, you want to have any of the following stats. Maximum life, flat elemental damage to attacks or to bow attacks, Critical Strike Multiplier, Penetration, any Attack Speed Modifier, or any Regeneration Modifier or Resistance, as well as Phasing on Kill. By this point, you should already be very familiar with Spell Suppression, and you should be aiming to have 100% of it. So as previously, you were probably being capped by Lucky Suppression Mastery. Now you want to make sure that you are fully capped. So make sure that you're getting to 100% at this point. At this point in progression, you should be considering a six link rare body armor. You're looking for a base such as the Assassin's Garb or the Zodiac Leather. And you want to be looking for any of the following stats. Maximum life, chance to suppress spell damage, chance to avoid elemental damage, chance to avoid elemental ailments, which is crafted, percent increased evasion or any resistance. Keep in mind that Chaos Resistance is also very valuable. You can further craft this using Eldritch Embers and Eldritch Ickers. The implicits you're looking for on Embers are percent increased effect of non-cursed auras from your skills or all resistance or flash charges gained every second. For Ickers, you're primarily looking for Grace has increased effect, Haste has increased aura effect or anger, percent increased evasion or percent all elemental resistance. 
If at this point you are already amassed some currency, you can also just skip this step and go straight purchasing at high desire. However, make sure that you are buying a six link one or have enough currency to link one yourself. However, I do not recommend in early game trying to link something yourself. Of course, you can be lucky, but the average of linking an item is one in 1,500 fusings. And fusings can be very expensive early because people love gambling. So keep that in mind. For our ring bases, we want to prioritize vermilion rings as well as amethyst rings, opals, or two stones. And the preferred stats on these is going to be maximum life, increased elemental damage with attack skills, accuracy if you need it, percent of resistances or chaos resistance, as well as attack speed. If you have a free suffix or prefix, you can craft the percent increased global critical strike chance and critical strike multiplier if you shatter an enemy recently, or you can also craft minus to mana cost of skills as a prefix. For your quiver, you're going to be looking for much of the attack scaling stats that we previously mentioned. We want life, increased elemental damage with attack skills, damage with bows, percent to critical strike multiplier, flat added attack damage, bow attacks fire additional arrows, or accuracy if needed, as well as some resistances as well. The best quiver base for our bow build is going to be the feathered arrow quiver, as we can double dip on this bonus, going to give us 30% increased projectile damage, as well as 30% projectile speed, thanks to the mastery. At this point in progression, we are well past the leak start, and you're going to be looking to upgrade all of your pieces of gear. So make sure that if you do get past the stage, you want to be looking at the max roll guide for any of the following stats on your gear. So I will mouse over all of the items and just give a brief overview. So much of the stats on the bow are going to be the same as previously mentioned, flat damage, attack speed, and critical strike chance. You will be using the Vol's vision at this point, and that is going to give us a ton of increased life and increased life regeneration. For rings, we will look for life regeneration as well as life and resistances. The gloves are going to be uh, Combs Spirit, and Combs Spirit is going to be enabling the Rage technology that we previously mentioned. For our belt, we want to be getting a belt with very high life, high regeneration, resistances, and open prefixes for elemental damage with attacks. Irish Truth is going to remain our amulet of choice until endgame, until you can afford an Omniscience. However, we are not going to talk about that in this build guide, as that is a much more endgame build that you can actually check out the guide for also on max roll. For your boots, you're going to be prioritizing boots with percent increased life regeneration fractured and resistances life and movement speed. Keep in mind the percent increased life regeneration fracture is only available on armor bases. So you're going to be opting in for an armor evasion base here. However, you can also get flat regeneration fractured or flat resistance fractured and roll an essence until you get either or. Your quiver is going to have a lot of damage stats, additional life and arrows. And in endgame, we will also want to be using the Dying Sun. However, this is totally optional, but the Dying Sun will give us two additional projectiles, so that will both increase our clear and single target. That about sums up the build. It is going to be a very fast leak starter that you'll be able to take on all endgame mapping content with, and you'll have sort of a clear path to upgrade to. It is my favorite ascendancy in the game, and I think it's one of the fastest builds uh, going through maps. And I hope that you've enjoyed this guide, and it's helped you make your decision on your leak starter. If you have any questions of course you can always drop by my twitch channel twitch.tv forward slash crouching underscore tuna or you can just drop a comment here i hope you've enjoyed the video i hope you've enjoyed the content and i hope to see you guys again soon subscribe as well if you like the video i appreciate you guys thank you for watching have a good 322 leak start